start out by posing the question to all of you. You are obviously uh, very prominent in the positions that you hold right now. You have worked very hard to get there. What was your single biggest challenge in this climb, and how did you overcome it? For me, the biggest challenge has been balancing my professional life with my personal life. A lot of people don't like to say you have to have balance, but there does have to be some of it. Um, and both sides need undivided time and undivided attention. So what I try to do is when I'm at the office, I prioritize, I schedule, try to get everything done I can in a day. I also think it's really important to consciously find a stopping point because there's always more you can do at home and at work. So give it your all while you're there. When you get home, disconnect because your family needs your undivided time and attention too. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old and they will call me out in a hot minute if I'm phone scrolling while they're trying to talk to me. So I think it's just a matter of giving your focus and your attention to each side equally. Amy? Um, I think for me, when I, when I first transitioned from journalism to the, the port industry and international trade, um, if I went to a conference and there were 500 people in the room, um, I felt like Dr. Tim down here in the front. It was me and a bunch of guys in suits. Um, and there might be one or two other women in the room. So when, when people talk about working in a male-dominated industry, 25 years ago when I got in the port industry, it was truly a male-dominated industry, and there were very few women um, in upper-level management or even mid-level management-level positions. And so for me, the biggest challenge was, as our, as our keynote speaker said, it was kind of learning how to be a woman in a man's universe and not being ashamed of being a woman in a man's universe. And so being able to be sensitive and being able to show emotion and being able to not be as good with confronting an employee that maybe I had issues with as maybe a man would be in a more direct fashion. So it was learning to kind of be comfortable in my own skin, but still navigate in that male-dominated world. Mary? For me, it was really having the confidence to jump off after having worked in my industry for 25 years for other companies, to have the confidence to believe that I could really build a company and have it be successful. And that's pretty scary, you know, because I've always had other people that could help me, and it was really going to be me and my husband doing it by ourselves. And um, we were very fortunate in that things did work out, but it's a pretty scary thought. But I kind of went with it where that if it didn't work, it didn't work, but I was just going to jump off that cliff and see what happened. And I did. Dr. Ledeck? Um, I think, is my mic on? Okay. Uh, for me, one of the challenges was I started my academic career very young. I was a professor at 23 years old. Um, and it also happened that I started my career at my alma mater, Xavier University in New Orleans. Um, and so when I got there with, for my first teaching gig, um, I, there were some super duper seniors who had been undergraduates when I was there who were suddenly still students there and looking at me like, what are you doing here? Um, and so that was a little jarring. Um, it was also interesting trying to navigate those relationships with former professors and administrators who knew me as a student and now I was, um, you know, part of their team. I always remember the first graduation that I attended, I got thrown out of the faculty line. One of the faculty members came and said, honey, the master's students go over there. I said, I'm faculty. And so she laughed and said, oh, that used to happen to me too. But at any rate, um, but being young and a woman and just starting out, um, you know, I really had to find my voice. I really had to not be afraid um, to know what I know and feel comfortable in, in saying that. And I think, especially for young professionals, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to kind of feel confident enough to get started and to stand your ground when you, when you get in that new position. So I think that was probably one of the most difficult things for me. When you talk about standing your ground, how exactly do you do that? How do you assert yourself without over asserting yourself where, where do you strike that balance and we'll come back this way I think I probably 
overasserted myself a few times, but um, and sometimes it gets to that point, you know. But um, I think it, you know, it's very important to make sure that you're contributing to the conversation. When you're new to something, sometimes, you know, if you're in your first board meeting, um, there's a tendency to, you know, kind of be like a deer in headlights and think, oh, well, I don't have anything to contribute to this conversation because all these people have more experience than me. No, you have something new to contribute to the conversation. You have a different perspective sometimes that people need to hear. So don't be afraid to use your voice to speak up. Um, another thing, I uh, my background was actually in communication as well. That was another link that many of us had. Um, but I can remember uh, I taught studio production. And that's kind of a guy's industry. And so when I came in and asked questions about setting up things in the studio, they would tell me, you don't have to do that. Just call us. We'll come in and fix it for you. So I literally went in one day and unplugged everything. And then I went and got one of them and said, hey, can you come and show me how to set it up? And they wanted to kill me. But I learned, and you know, we never had a problem again. So that's, you know, that may be a little going over the edge. But sometimes, you, you know, again, you have to stand up for yourself, and you have to say, hey, I'm here. I have something to contribute. And don't be afraid to take that initiative. For me, I would say that I always try to be fair. I try to listen to people. But at the end of the day, Things have to get done, and I need my team behind me to help me do that. And I work with a lot of um, personalities who are not um, necessarily willing to listen all the time. They think that they know it all. And they know a lot. I do believe that they do know a lot. But it's hard to get them sometimes to listen to the, the big picture and not just look at their own individual world. And at that point, I kind of have to just say, sometimes I just have to say, you have to do it because this is the way it has to be done. And usually after the woods, they'll come back and they'll say, well, you know, you were right. I might not have agreed with you at the time, but you were right. So I just try to be fair and open as best you can. That's, that's I think, very true, Mary, because you always, you come to a point, everyone in the organization wants to feel like they need to know everything all the time, and they don't, right? Sometimes you give a directive as a supervisor, and you know all the background, it's not necessarily important for everyone else in the organization to know that background. So sometimes you just have to do exactly what Mary said and say, well, I appreciate your input, I appreciate your insight, I appreciate your thoughts, but I have more background information, and so the reason that we've made this decision to do this this way is because of that. Um, and, and sometimes you just have to flat out tell people, what's the, what mothers always say, because I said so because I said so. And that's, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to say that. You have to do it that way because I said so. Plain and simple. And sometimes it comes down to that and just being able and comfortable and confident enough to say that um, and, and not beating about around the bush with it. I'll just ditto what everybody else said. Um, I also started out young with my company and at first was afraid to come to the table. And I find that if you have confidence, you do know what you know, you come to the table, you're professional, and courteous and you give your opinion, you share your knowledge and sometimes it involves getting in there and doing the work with them because I think in my industry working managers are very common. You can't just be a manager to tell people what to do, sometimes you have to get in there and do it with them and show them that you've been there and you know and you're with them in the fight. One of the things that uh, it was interesting in our conversation in preparation for this panel and I think where we probably spent a good bit of time was talking about the things that you do and you don't do in the workplace. Those interpersonal things, those how to dress, how to walk, how to talk things that sometimes cross generational lines. Where and how you draw that line when you move that line. So let's venture there. Because, and these ladies had some interesting stories to tell and I hope you'll share those with some things that you have observed. Um, and hopefully no one's here that you'll be discussing as you <laughs> talk about those things. I think in today's world of electronic communication, interpersonal skills, looking someone in the eye, a firm handshake, heaven forbid, a handwritten thank you note, a verbal conversation, not a typed one, these things have become almost the exception instead of the rule, which is kind of sad for our society as a whole. And I think they're an opportunity to almost differentiate yourself in a positive way this point if you can do those things. Um, I just, we need, sometimes just need to put down the devices and we need to talk to people and build relationships. And, um, oh, what else am I gonna tell you? I did 
Oh, we'll just do the round robin. We're, 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 they're, they're so formal and still. I've got a million of these. So <laughs> uh, there, there we go. They're, they're coming out now. I think professionalism is always appropriate in your behavior, in your dress, in your working with your colleagues and your clients. And a lot of organizations have a very casual environment, which is, an, is a nice thing, but you just have to be a little careful when it gets so casual because I think that's where the lines start to gray between appropriate and inappropriate. So you just have to be careful and you can never err with professionalism. That's, I'll tag on to that. I, I just, I'm gonna put it straight out there. No ifs, ands, or buts. I don't care how casual your office is. It is never appropriate, ever, to wear sleep pants to work. <laughs> ever. Don't do it. Not appropriate. If you slept in it the night before, don't wear it to the office tomorrow. I'm just saying. You know, the funny part of that is that Candy, who's on our morning show, which starts at 5 o'clock in the morning, often does show up in the studio. Well, okay, maybe there's one down. exception. <laughs> but she does change. Before I get to the office, she knows that she's got to be out of those pajama bottoms before I get there. And, and, and I know as well that I think Christina Leavenworth, who does the morning show, and not Leavenworth anymore, um, does the morning show on, on Channel 3, I think, shows up in her pajamas, but that's to go get her hair and makeup done before she changes to go on show, so. Okay. I, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you the rest of that story after this. <laughs> well, and another thing is, I actually interviewed a man last week. He was in his 50s, um, and he showed up at the interview, and it was for a professional position, he showed up in, for the interview in dungarees and a t-shirt. And I asked him about it. I said, why would you come to an interview dressed this way? And he said, well, I'm going on a road trip after this and I wanted to be comfortable in the car. <laughs> and I said to him, I have nothing to say to you. If, I do. I basically said, I'm not gonna, if, if you didn't want to waste a few minutes of your time to dress professionally, I'm not gonna waste any of mine talking to you. So you can just go ahead and leave right now. And he was stunned. He was absolutely stunned. Uh, we were talking about the importance of mentors in, in the last presentation, and I had a mentor who once told me, dress for the part you want. And I think that that's the most important thing. You know, really pay attention to the culture of your environment, but even still, when you first start out, dress even a step above what you may see. Um, you know, because your reflection, you know, when, when you're hiring someone, you want someone who reflects positively on your organization, on your department. Um, and so just keep that in mind, dress for the part that you want. Um, one of the things that, um, I, this is one of my pet peeves, Ladies, wear shoes you can walk in. <laughs> when you go for an interview, somebody may take you on a tour of the campus. You don't know where you'll be. Wear a shoe that you can walk a mile in and you'll be okay. All right? So that's just my one little piece of advice. <laughs> oh, yeah, the toenail painting story. You've got to share the toenail I, painting I, I story. I've been waiting for that. Yes, yeah, you must even, tell. You know, even as, as, as students, be conscious of... Uh, what you're doing when you're, you know, doing work study or working in an office. Um, it's not okay to paint your toes at the desk. Um, you know, I, and that, that's, I've unfortunately witnessed that. Um, so be conscious of your behavior when you are, when you're even, even when you're an intern, even when you're volunteering, be conscious of your behavior because you never know who's watching you. And that's never appropriate. And, and I think the, the portability of um, media devices has changed the workplace um, to some extent um, and so a lot of workplaces allow people to have personal cell phones at work um, they allow you to go on check your personal email they allow you to check Facebook those kinds of things just be conscious of how much time you're spending doing that stuff um, make sure that you know if you're on a personal call and a supervisor walks into your office you don't tell your supervisor to wait you tell the person you're on your phone call with to wait um, so just be conscious of those those kinds of things I'm not saying personal phones should be banned because I don't think they should um, but just be conscious of how much time you're spending during your workday doing personal stuff 
And I would also say um, for everybody on Facebook, don't think for a second that employers don't look at your Facebook page before they try to decide whether or not they're going to hire you, because we do. I look at Facebook every time before I hire somebody, and it's really critical that you not have a nasty Facebook page. And your friends, right? I, I mean, I've unfriended people because I'm like, you are a moron, and I don't want people to know that. <laughs> I don't want your posts on my page because I don't want, you know, so be conscious of that. Be conscious of, of what kind of image you're putting out there. Ladies, let's talk a little bit about the intergenerational issues that come up in the workplace. Uh, again, in many workplaces, there is, it's very diverse, a uh, wide range of ages. How do you mix, mesh everybody and still respect everyone for the different positions that they're bringing to the table. Mary? Okay, so here's a great example of this. It's hard, it's really hard. Just last night, I took the entire sales department to escape that place on Palafox where you figure out how to get out, and there were 10 of us. Five of us were over 40, and five of us were under 40. And when we walked into the room, there was this just division. The under 40 people went in one room, and the over 40 people went in the other room, without even, without even thinking about it. They do, they divide sometimes, and um, it's really difficult. I mean, it's, for me, it's a learning process every day because you know, I was brought up the way I was brought up, and I work the way I work, so it's really difficult for me when someone says to me, well, you know, I need work-life balance. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't even understand uh -oh, that. I said that when we first started. I think yeah. I, we better watch out. You leave when the work is done. <laughs> that, that's the way I was brought up. So it's hard. For, for me, I can honestly say it is a learning process every single day. And I try to be patient, and I try to understand, and I try to smile a lot. And, um, <laughs> And I just, sometimes I just pray that at the end of the day, I'm really going to understand it all. But it is very difficult. So for young people, understand that us older people are struggling with it. It's not just you struggling. We're struggling, too. Yeah. And it's a whole different dynamic in terms of communications, right? Because younger people communicate differently than, than we do. And so I still communicate with the weekly staff meeting where we sit in a room for an hour and I stand up and tell everybody what's going on this week and remind everyone who's responsible for what. And we go into exhaustive detail about all the projects we have underway. And the, the younger members of the workforce are used to communicating in 140 words or less. And so they're like, just send me an email. I don't need to come to a meeting. I don't need to sit in a room. We don't have to look each other face to face. We can do, we could have done all this over email and it would have taken 30 seconds and you just wasted an hour and a half of my time. Um, so like Mary said, those of us who are over 40 and over 50, um, we struggle with it as well. We recognize and realize that those of you who are under 40, under 30, communicate differently than we do and you struggle to communicate with us and we struggle to communicate with you, that's okay if we all understand that we understand, right? That we, we get it, we get that there's a difference and we're all just trying to navigate it as best we can and be respectful of each other at the same time, then it'll work itself out. Um, and I, I also function as the chief diversity officer here on campus. And so this is, um, we teach a course uh, in, as part of HR where it's called Rock of Ages, some of you may have taken it, where we look at, this is the first time that we have four going on five generations in the workplace at the same time. Um, and so it's really important, you know, we think about other forms of diversity, but really the diversity of generations in the workplace brings a lot of challenges to the table that we sometimes don't even think about. We don't realize that that's the cause behind some of these things. Um, but the more important thing to do is to recognize the strengths of each generation. When you're having technology issues or trying to figure out the best way to do things, find a millennial right because they will save the day when it comes to something being more formal you know uh, people who have been in the workplace for a long time they're gurus at, at the formal and the, you know the appropriate process to do those things and so a lot of times it's very helpful to think about that diversity when you bring a group around the table because it's gonna lead to a better outcome because you're you know trying to appeal usually to a very diverse audience so very important to think about that I agree with what everybody said. My favorite saying on this topic is, you will know me not so much by the gray in my hair, but by the punctuation and capitalization in my text messages. <laughs> <laughs> and it just 
remember it's hard to convey tone and emotion and attitude in an email or a text. Sometimes you have to do it face to face because you don't get the whole message across. As we are giving hopefully some, some good advice, for people who are climbing that ladder, trying to make it to the positions that you now hold or what, what, whatever uh, their lofty goals in life might be, along the way we encounter those difficult supervisors, those difficult bosses, the difficult company owners. How have you dealt with those individuals when you encountered them? Amy? Um, I've encountered, encountered a few. Um, and I've handled them in different ways. Um, sometimes it comes out, it comes down to determining whether or not the experience, the experience you're having is worth it ultimately, right? So sometimes the way you handle it is just walking out the door. I mean, just get in your box, putting your stuff in it, and going, you know what? <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I am done. Uh, and I've done that. Um, but the other thing that you have to do when it is worth it, when you know that this is where you need to be, not just for now, but for your future as well. It's having the confidence to know that you're on the right side. You know, if you know every day that you're doing the right things for the right reasons, um, then you can face a lot of that and, and face it um, successfully and overcome it successfully. Um, and, and, you know, another thing too is just to have humor. Man, don't get, sometimes it's just not worth getting all bundled up about it. You know, do something every day that makes you not take yourself so seriously. Um, because you can. I mean, you can get into these roles where you're like, it's it's just 100 miles an hour all the time, and you start to take yourself too seriously. Um, and when you start to take yourself too seriously, you start to put too much value in other, what other people are thinking, right? And sometimes it doesn't matter what other people are thinking, as long as you know you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Um, so my thing that I do every day to not take myself so seriously is crazy socks. I love crazy socks. Um, <laughs> Because I get frustrated during the day, and I look down and I giggle, right? Um, so, but, but sometimes you, you do just have to have the courage to walk out the door, too. And you have to know when that time has come as well. Um, I, and another thing I think that you have to think about sometimes is a lot of times, you know, there are different types of um, challenges that you'll face. And so, of course, sometimes it's a challenge, you know, because somebody's challenging you for the sake of challenging you, right? And I'll also say sometimes you realize that, you know, you're not doing things right unless you're making somebody mad, right? So, so keep that in the back of your mind. But the other thing is sometimes, uh, you know, especially in those relationships with others, with mentors, with bosses and things like that, I have an example um, from a, a mentor when I was in graduate school. Um, her name was Dr. Lee Thornton. She passed away a couple years ago. But um, I met her when I was in graduate school. She was the um, first African-American White House correspondent. And she just decided that I needed to do the same thing that she did. And I did not want to be in television. I was like, I tried it. I don't like it. If they tell me to stand in a hurricane, I'm going to leave. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, and so she was so hard on me. I remember right before I started looking for a job, I cut my hair. She's like, what did you do? I said, what do you mean? She's like, nobody's going to know you in your resume tape anymore. You don't even look like the same person. You just fussed at me for that. Uh, I kept telling her, you know, when I decided I wanted to go the academic route, well, why do you want to do that? Well, why are you majoring in that? You know, she just, it seemed like she was always on me for something, right? And so it was just when I, when I graduated, we kept in touch, we check in every so often, and I was just like, gosh, I can't make this woman happy. Well, about 12 years after I finished my graduate program, it just so happened I went for an accreditation visit and her university was there as well. And I didn't even know she was in the room. And I got up and I did my little spiel. And as I walked out the door, she comes running behind me, Kim. And she turned me around and she held me by the shoulders and she said, I am so proud of you. And I said, well, it only took you 12 years to tell me. <laughs> and what I didn't realize at that, you know, in the, at the time that I was really working with her, she was pushing me. She was challenging me because she wanted me to be the best person that I could be. And I see myself doing it even now sometimes with you know, my mentees, I challenge them, I give them a hard time, but the reality is I figure if I'm the worst thing they encounter, they're gonna be that much better for it when they get where they're going. So think about that, keep that in the back of your mind. Sometimes when people are challenging you, it's because they see a gift in you, they see your talent, and they're trying to push you to be your best. Over my career when I felt challenged, I tend to ask a lot of questions and I kind of push back a little bit. You know, if I have a supervisor that I know is upset with me, it's the New Yorker in me, I can't help it. 
But um, so I ask questions. I'm like, well, why are you upset? What did I do wrong? Help me do it right. What should I have done? You know, and sometimes they get aggravated and they're like, just go away. But I've always believed that if someone is going to, you know, be angry with me, I at least want to know why and, and, and try to work it out. And nine times out of ten, they will talk to you and they will, it will get smoothed over. And then they kind of respect the fact that you had the nerve to go and ask some questions about it. So don't be afraid, is my attitude. And I think sometimes it's as simple as just not every personality is going to mesh with every other personality. And in a big organization, you're going to have to deal with that. And sometimes the people that you think you're not getting along with, whatever's wrong, is not really so much about you as it is maybe something about them that's going on in their own life. And so if there's someone that you just really can't stand being around, limit your exposure to that person to just what it takes to get your job done. You know, no one says you have to hang out with them. That's a fault I had because I hate to admit it in this room, but I'm a pleaser and I want everyone to like me and do y'all like me? <laughs> um, but yeah, you just, it, everyone doesn't have to like you and it's okay. As long as you know that you're doing your job well and you're being respectful, it's okay if you don't get along with everybody. And that pleaser, being a pleaser, I think that's something that women struggle with quite a bit. You're not going to make everybody happy all the time and that's okay. That's okay. You have to come to terms with that and realize that that's okay. But it took me about 20 years in my job to get to that point, so it's okay if you're not there yet. What happens when you mess up? When you make a mistake? When you've done it wrong? I you never mess up. No. <laughs> All right, let me find another question here. I'll take this one. You just own it. You own it, and you apologize for it, and you take steps to fix it. Everybody makes mistakes, but people respect you a lot more if you just stand up and say, I did it, I'm sorry, I'm going to fix it, than if you spend all this time figuring out why it happened and who's to blame for it. That just doesn't accomplish anything. So own it and fix it as fast as you can. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's simple. Own it and fix it and, and move on. And, and sometimes you can't fix it, right? I mean, sometimes you... Um, there are those occasions where you just can't fix it. Um, move on. Move on to the next thing. It's not the end of the world. And sometimes Maybe. those are the best lessons learned, Absolutely. is when you mess up, you, you learn something in that process. So really look for that lesson. I think that's important as well. When you do that, though, do you still maintain the respect of those individuals who work for you, under you? I, I think more. I think you build even more respect and more camaraderie because they see that you're human enough to not, you know, blow it off, to not to, look, I messed up, man. I, I told you to do that. I shouldn't have asked you to do it that way. In retrospect, it was a stupid idea. Um, if I ever tell you to do it that way again, don't. <laughs> don't do it. Remind me. Remind me that we just went through this exercise and it didn't work out. Um, and I think you gain more respect that way, really. This time we'd like to entertain questions from our audience. If you haven't any, we do have the microphone Already? at the front of wow, the room. Wow, that flew. Hello. Um, is the microphone on? Okay. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here. This is a really great panel, so I've had a lot of fun listening to you. Um, I'm a senior business student here at UWF, and I was lucky enough to be offered a job um, right out of college. and. I'm going to be the only female in my department, so it's a little bit scary. Do you have any suggestions or advice for the first day or the first week kind of thing, getting into the swing of things? I mean, why don't we start with you, since it's certainly a very, 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 very male-dominated <laughs> profession that you're in still today. Let's see if I can think back all those years ago. Um, realize how awesome you are, right? I mean, holy cow, you're graduating, you've already got a job, you're phenomenal. Know that. I mean, seriously, go into it knowing that. It's, it may be my first, je first day, and I may be in a department with all guys, and I may be in a department with people that have more experience than me. I can learn from them. They have a lot to teach me, but I am phenomenal, accomplished, and amazing in my own right. And you go into it with that, and you'll be just fine. Any other questions, please feel free. Oh, come on. 
Well, while the next person is making their way up, because I know that there have got to be other questions, we have an incredible uh, pool of talent sitting here, and, and certainly we want to take advantage of that. So I'm going to pose a question to you. Dovetailing on what she said, sometimes as women, and especially if we're surrounded by men, you talked about the, the men who said, well, just call us to do it. Is it advantageous to use that position as a woman? Well, oh, the heads are nodding already. As a woman, if you would, uh, to further your goals, to, to, to get certain things done. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, God, come on. Guys love nothing more than helping a damsel in distress. <laughs> they love it. Right? So, I, I mean, there ain't no shame in my game. I'll take help wherever I can get it. <laughs> Seriously, exploit it. I mean, you know, get them, to, get them to come help you with it and then tell them how awesome they were. And then you've got them. Then you got them. I told you they were brutally honest and, um, and entertaining women. Does anyone not feel the same way? I totally feel the same way. My attitude is, you know, you can get more bees with honey or whatever that expression is. But, um, and it's always fun then when you ask them for their help and they help you or you, you act defend, you know, that you need their help and they help you. And then the next time it comes up, you do it better than them and you kick their butt. That's the best part. <laughs> that is the best part. Now, but make no mistake, that said, and we're having a lot of fun, there is a line. Yes, <laughs> Don't cross that line, ladies. Don't do it. You know the line I'm talking about, right? Don't do it. Appropriate versus inappropriate Yes, behavior. appropriate versus inappropriate behavior. Hi. Thank you so much for all of you said. Um, for those of us that may struggle with vulnerability, uh, how do you manage that line of maintaining maybe a little damsel in distress, just enough, and or sharing warmth if you actually want to be warm or if you're not naturally warm? You know, can you each talk about that a little bit? I think uh, you know it, it's funny. You have to be conscious of how people perceive you. So, for example, I smile a lot, right? And I think sometimes people take that smile for a weakness. Um, but I'm not afraid to exert myself. I'm not afraid to do business when it's time to do business. And so I think the most important thing is be genuine. Be who you are, right? Um, you, shouldn't, you, don't have to, you don't have to play a role in that environment. I like to have fun. I think you should have fun at work. But at the same time, business is business, right? Um, and I think when you're interacting with people, don't feel pressured to fall into a certain role in order to appease. Right, uh, it, it's important to be who you are, and you know, and to be conscious of how people may perceive you for who you are. Um, but I, you know, I, I just I think it's important to be genuine, no matter what you do. Yeah, I'm. I'm. This is going to come as a surprise to some of you, but I'm not naturally very outgoing. Um, I'm great in a room of 500 or a thousand put me with five other people at a cocktail party and I am absolutely terrified. I mean, it's like my worst nightmare. Um, and, and a lot of my job is um, dealing with customers, dealing with prospective customers, dealing with tenants, and it's not a normal, um, comfortable situation for me. And I realize that, and I realize that become, because of that, I have somewhat of a reputation of being a little standoffish um, in, in personal, more, more intimate um, settings. Um, so I struggle with that. Um, so I really make it a point um, to be warm. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a jokester and a little bit of a storyteller, so I use that to convey my warmth because I'm not naturally a warm, huggy, outgoing person in intimate social settings, so. <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice. Um, I won an award fairly recently, and I struggled with whether or not to let my supervisor know that I had won the award. And I discussed it with a girlfriend, um, and she's a very accomplished uh, lady. And she admitted to me when I said that I might want to share this with my supervisor, she said, you know, I had an inner moment of cringing, like, ugh, self-promoting. As a woman, you know, how could you do that? And I've noticed um, in multiple workplaces the same 
women are very hesitant to self-promote. Is there any advice that you might be able to give um, how to overcome that, how to help other women overcome that as we try and you know, move forward in our careers? Great question. I would say absolutely share that. As a supervisor, I would love to know when people that are on my team are winning awards, unless it's you know winning for like being the top stripper in town or something like that. <laughs> but I would want to know that, and that's a great thing. And then to be able to share that with the rest of your team, I mean, I think it raises everybody up to the level where everyone wants to win awards. So I think it's a great thing to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you want to know that um, the people on your team, that people are celebrating them. I mean, what does that say about your team if, you know, if they're out there getting awards? And I think that's another thing that as women, we have to support one another. And so it may not, you know, if you're uncomfortable doing it, do you have a colleague who can celebrate with you and for you and bring it to everybody's attention? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. But, you, you know, you deserve to be celebrated. So yeah. congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> And also, if you're not afraid to do it, you might encourage someone else who was a little more shy and a little more, you know, afraid to come forward to do the same thing and, and advance herself as well. So you almost owe it to your team to do it and bring everybody with you. We all know that women tend to have a cattiness about ourselves. Um, in general, what you find is, and I've always said this, is that you have women who are the same as we were when we were in high school, we just disguise it better. Um, so how do you, what advice and what suggestions do you have for helping, uh, as we talk about mentorship and mentor relationships, how do you do that and avoid the cattiness at the same time? What advice do you have on that? You know, it's, it's, you touched on something that, that it, it's sad, but women are so judgmental of other women, right? And we should be each other's source of strength and each other's source of support, and we should be there building each other up um, and helping each other succeed and helping each other navigate the, the unique challenges we face as women when it comes to work-life interface, because I also don't think there's really balance. <laughs> That's, interface, um, from now on it's interface. Um, <laughs> and there's always gonna be that girl. I mean, there's just always gonna be that girl. And frankly, she's not worth your time, and she's not worth your effort, and she's not worth your energy. Um, you know, that the way she makes herself feel better and give her life more value is to tear yours down. Don't give it any attention. Don't pay any attention to it at all. Don't acknowledge it. Just ignore it. Don't engage it. Certainly don't engage it, because then you just give it power. Right, and I think again, kind of like what you said about in the workplace, you want to minimize your time with people like that. It's not to say that you don't occasionally encounter that and have to deal with it, but minimize it, right? Um, and it's also important on the flip side to think about that in the relationships that you have and make sure that you are truly there and you're truly supportive for the people around you and vice versa, that they're there and that they're truly supporting you. Um, because uh, that, that network, you know, I call it personal board of advisors, um, but you wanna make sure that you have people who are truly your supporters. Not everybody needs to be a cheerleader. You also need that person who can be honest with you, but honest in a genuine way and in a supportive way. There's a big difference there. And minimizing your time with that person also requires you to recognize that you can't necessarily completely eliminate them from your life, right? You may have to have exposure to them. Always be the bigger person. Always be cordial. Always be polite. Always be friendly. Let them look like the small person they are and you always be the bigger person. Always. And I would say always take the higher road for sure. And just know those people are toxic in an organization and eventually they'll, they'll get weeded out and they'll be gone. So the best thing you can do is to just don't partake in it. If someone wants to gossip or whatever, just walk away. Just walk away. It's toxic. Along those same lines, how do you handle the transition from a coworker to supervisor within the same organization? The people you've work with, been friends with, socialized with, and now you're the supervisor. Carefully and respectfully. <laughs> uh, 
I, it, it actually, the timing for me um, to become port director was was advantageous for me in that regard because it came at a time when um, the, the the staff of the port here is a relatively small staff. All of the all of the activity that happens out on the port is all done by private businesses, um, so the port staff is really small. It's it's fourteen folks. Um, and, and I got promoted to port director at a time when we were having a cycle of retirements. Um, so that made it easy because I've hired a lot of the folks and so they came into it knowing me as, as the port director. Um, but I do have a couple of coworkers who were coworkers at the time and, and to me they still are. I mean, I don't know if they see me differently. I don't see them any differently though and I don't treat them any differently. We're, we're still all a team um, and I will always defend them always. Um, and if they make a mistake, it's my mistake at the end of the day. And I will always take responsibility for it. And I will never hang one of them out to dry, ever, under any circumstances. For me, um, you know, I, I'm a small family-owned business, and radio is a very small business in general. So as we were building the company, the people that worked with us really became our friends. I mean, they were our only friends. We moved here, we didn't know anyone. So our staff became our friends. So as Christy said, it's all about respect. And you know, we work together really hard, but they seem to know that they're here to, we're all here for the same purpose and let's do the right thing. And you know, maybe I have one more stripe on my shoulder than they do, but we're really all a team. Hello, ladies. Um, one of the topics that came up at our um, table at lunch was, as we're talking about personal and work-life interface, is when we talk about that topic, we tend to make the assumption that it's the traditional family, children, husband. And that's not always the case with our coworkers, um, and in some cases ourselves. And so, um, how do we elevate that conversation so that those that don't choose the traditional path um, don't feel that they're put upon in the, work, in the workplace or that um, they're, what they value outside of the workplace is not as important as what, um, you know, family, children, or whatever the case may be? Well, I mean, I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> there's an assumption, you know, that when you have children and you have a family, you have other responsibilities. And then on the flip side of that, people sometimes assume that if you're single and you don't have kids, that you have all the time in the world to give to your organization. Um, and so one of the things that um, I encourage people to do is to, you know, be conscious of that. And when people make that assumption, correct that. That you do have a life outside of where you are. Uh, you know, outside of where you work, I should say, um, and you know, and and that you need to be just as protective of your time as those who who have a family. So I think I think that's an important um, consideration to make from a management perspective. But also, as an employee, do not feel that you know you you have to give your soul simply because everybody assumes you have nothing else to do because that's not the case at all. You know, I always had a hard time with this because my husband and I don't have any children. So it was difficult for me to understand when someone would say they would want go to go home at the end of the day and be with their children. So a few years ago, I got a little kitten. And now my whole world has changed. I mean, I don't know how anybody can leave their kids at home and go to work. I just don't understand it. So that was really helpful to, for me to understand what it was all about. So... You, you, need to, you need to spend time with your kids, for sure. We're and laughing, I, but she's very serious about that kid. <laughs> yeah, she is. And I think as a, as a supervisor, it's important to um, value everyone's reality, right? We don't all have the same reality. So as a supervisor, it's important, whether it's um, the employee who needs to leave early to go to their kid's science fair, um, or whether it's the employee who needs to leave early because their brother's car broke down, they're just as important to those people. Um, and so, so you have to kind of recognize that everyone's reality is equal in importance to them, and you have to respect that. And I think it's important to start that at the top of the organization because that sets the tone, and then everybody feels a part of the team and equal and treated fairly. So if we're at the top of the organization, we need to make sure that we try to implement that. Obviously, you've worked hard and reached the positions that you hold now. Is that your definition of success? What is 
your definition of success? So for me, if it happens approximately 10 years from now, and I am on a beach somewhere holding a pina colada, <laughs> that will be success. I mean, I, I'm lucky I do something I love to do and I enjoy going to work every day, but make no mistake, if I didn't have a mortgage and bill, I wouldn't go to work. I mean, nobody wants to work. So my definition of success is somewhere around 10 years from now when I get to call it quits and enjoy the rest of my life, that's success. And do it comfortably, hopefully. Go ahead, please. Mary's definition is how many country music awards Cat Country gets every year. I recently had um, the, the pleasure of watching my manager resolve um, a really uncomfortable situation at work where a few people felt berated and disempowered and he stepped in one-on-one -on -one and completely turned the situation around and he gave the power to each of the individuals that were involved. I'm not comfortable with confrontation, but clearly I've got to learn to become so, right, in a leadership position. So tell us a little bit about um, how you became comfortable, assuming you are, how you became comfortable with things that are, could be confrontational. What did that look like and how long did that take? I hate confrontation and I will put it off as long as I can put it off. I mean, I really hate it. I hate having to, I, I, to me, the worst thing in, in work in every year is the time of year where you have to do employee reviews, right? You have to do performance evaluations. I hate it. I hate it because there's always somebody that you really need to be moving along a little faster. And I just hate that confrontation. I hate that whole conversation. And it takes me days, literally days, to, to work up to it. Um, but once you get to that point that you've worked up to it, you can't put it off any further. I mean, sometimes it's all smoke and mirrors, right? The only person that knows you're uncomfortable is you. So smoke and mirrors, baby. Put, <laughs> put the shoulders back, put the smile on the face, and fake it till you make it. Sometimes that's the best you can do. Um, what, well, one of the, uh, I think you guys are going to be provided a list with our book recommendations, but one of the books that um, I've, that was very helpful to me in terms of dealing with that is a book called The Energy Bus. I don't know if anybody's read that by John Gordon. And, um, you know, one of the things that you have to realize um, when you're managing people is that not everybody wants to be on the bus with you, and that's okay, right? Um, some may just decide that they want to get off at this stop and they have to think about it and decide if they want to continue on the journey. Um, sometimes they just want off, and, and that's fine, right? Um, and so for me, I think the thing was that I, as long as I know that the difficult situation that I'm handling, that I'm ha doing this because it's in the best interest of an individual, of my organization, as long as I know I can sleep at night and I'm okay with it, I have to do what I have to do. Right, and so sometimes it's not fun, it's not comfortable, but that's all part of leadership, is having to make those difficult decisions, having to sometimes have difficult conversations. But I think that what I like about that book is it, it really makes you think about, you know, you tend to think me, me, me when you're doing that, but it really helps you kind of flip it and think about where the other person's mindset may be. And I'm the exact opposite of Amy. If I have to confront someone, I have to do it right away because the longer I wait, the bigger it gets in my mind. And um, so I'm a person where if something happens, I, I address it immediately and then just move on. You know, and there's no hard feelings. We just talk about it and just move on down the road. Chrissy, how about you? Because you, you, you want to be liked. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, I don't like it, and I, I don't know that you ever get to a point where just because you're in a leadership position, you're okay with confrontation. Some people are, I don't know that I ever will be, but I take more of Mary's approach. Um, as long as I know that I'm coming at it from the right angle, and I know that I'm gonna do the right thing for the organization and for the person, and I can sleep at night, then I'm okay with that. And maybe it gets easier, maybe not, but it is just a part of leadership, and you just have to do it, and, and I like to just rip the bandaid off. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys so much for all your wonderful advice. Um, I think as women, we tend to fall victim to the never wanting to say no thing. 
that happens to me a lot. It's happened to me since I've gotten out of college because I tend to present as sort of the path of least resistance for these, you know, less entertaining tasks that would other people might, you know, put up more of a fight to do. How do you how do you deal with something like that? How do you come back whenever uh, someone asks you to do something and you say, I don't have time for that, and they go, you have time for that? Go right back at them. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of the things that I always say is no doesn't mean never, it just means not right now, Ooh, right? And so sometimes you have to tell people that. I, honestly, I don't even think you'd want me to do this for you right now, <laughs> but you know, maybe down the road, if, if the opportunity presents itself, then I'll be there. But um, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I tend to be a yes girl sometimes, and I've had to learn, you know, when you, when you move up the chain and you're, you're working in a management position and you have other obligations, you can't say yes to everything. Um, and sometimes that's difficult, again. But again, no doesn't mean never. It just means no right now, right? And I'm a total failure at it. I don't know how to say no. I must be honest. I, I just, I'm, o I'm overcommitted most, most days. And I don't know how to stop it. So when you figure it out, will you let me know? <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. I, I'm so overcommitted. You have no idea. <laughs> I think maybe the only person in this room that's more overcommitted is Megan McCarthy. She, <laughs> she really can't say no. <laughs> but do you find a peace with that? Are you okay with it? And does that help you? Um, sometimes maybe just stop sweating the fact that I should say no. Well, I don't say no. I did it to that myself. Me. I mean, I did it to myself. I have to be okay with it. You know, I, I mean, and I did Sue, it to myself. how do you handle it? You don't say no either. <laughs> and I have a piece about that. <laughs> I have a piece. <laughs> But I, I mean, I think for me, it's, you know, sometimes I have to honestly think, am I, gonna, am, am I able to give my best self? And if I know I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that if I say yes, then I just think that it's in everybody's best interest, again, that for now I say no. Um, because, yeah, I, I mean, I have a tendency to do the same thing. You overcommit, you find yourself having to be in three places at one time, and, and you can't be your best and give your best when that's the situation. I did that for several years too. I was very overcommitted and I found that my work performance was suffering, my, my personal life was suffering, my sleep was suffering. I mean, you get to a point where you really can't do your best or be your best for anyone when you're into too many things. And just like some relationships are toxic and you have to call them, sometimes your extracurriculars and your activities and your commitments can be things that you need to call. And you need to find the things that you have a passion for and that make you happy and that really help other people and let the rest of it go. And don't underestimate the value of a vacation, right? And it doesn't have to be a week-long vacation. It doesn't have to be a two-day, two-week vacation. It could be a two-day vacation where you just shut down. You just block your whole calendar off. You take off of work and you shut down. Um, that can be so invigorating that it gives you the energy to stay overcommitted the rest of the time. Um, but never undervalue that, and and never. I mean, really, always, always, always try to find time to take, you know, a couple, even if they're just one or two days, little breaks during the year. Um, you know, it, especially when you're young, you feel like you have to work all the time, you have to prove yourself, and you're working your way up the corporate ladder, and I don't have time to take time off. Make time. Make time for you. Ladies, we have about four minutes left, so uh, about a minute for each of you. If you would, if you could go back and do something differently. What would that be? I would say I don't know that I would change anything specific about my career path. I've enjoyed every step of the way. I've enjoyed starting at the bottom, working my way up, learning as I, as I went. But I was a really stressed out 20-something, 30-something, and 40-something. And I think it's just, it's just no fun, and life is short. So. Let yourself relax. Don't take yourself so seriously. Don't sweat the small step. It's cliche because it's true. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your career. Enjoy your networks and your people. And just give yourself a break. That's what I would do different. I'd have a lot more relaxed years. <laughs> uh, <go ahead. laughs> I don't know that I would do anything differently. I, might not, I just might not do it to the same intensity level that I've done it, I think. And I would have gotten a cat a lot sooner.
Um, you know, I think, um, as I said, when I was younger, I, I, you know, I made a decision about a major and I felt very much like I was, that was what I had to do with my life and, you know, very um, kind of panicked about that at one point. Um, and I, I, I think I was a planner. I always felt the need to plan everything. And I think when I look back on my life, some of the best things that happened were the things that I had no idea were coming. Um, you know, and you always, it sounds kind of cliche to say enjoy the journey, but a lot of times, uh, you, you know, you just have no idea who you're going to meet and where life's going to take you. So just enjoy it a little bit more. There's a quote from my book that I put in the um, program from Nora Ephron, and she said, it's messy, embrace the mess. It's complicated, rejoice in the complication. And it may turn out nothing like you thought it was going to turn out, but surprises are good for you. And I think if there were a way to end this session, uh, that would be the way to do it. Because for all of their successes, and the most difficult question for them to answer was what would you do differently? For all of what was planned, unplanned, anticipated, and not, there's not a whole lot they change about it. It's about the journey. And I think that's a good message for all of us. Enjoy the journey. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for sharing.